Good morning from Point of View Retreat and Research Center in Belmont Bay in Virginia. My name is Kevin Averick. I am the Dean of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And um, I, I do want to open this, this happy occasion with uh, a sad note, and that is that our friend and colleague of many, many decades, Dennis Sandoli, passed away this, this weekend. Uh, Dennis was actually the first full-time faculty member at SCAR when it was then the Center for Conflict Resolution, and he uh, came here in uh, 19, 1981. I do want to announce, there'll be a more formal announcement, that funeral services will be held on Friday, this Friday, May 11th at noon, at the Fairfax Memorial Gardens, which are on Braddock Road. Um, indulge me with uh, at least a symbolic moment of silence to remember Dennis. Thank you. Uh, Dennis would be pleased that on the first work day after his passing, scholars and students and colleagues would gather together at Point of View to do what he really devoted his life to, and that is a life of research, scholarship, and teaching in the area of peace and conflict study, something that he indeed devoted his life to after service as a law enforcement officer in New Jersey and a uh, member of the Marine Corps. Uh, he turned his life and, and his uh, tremendous intellect and passion towards the study of uh, peace. So in that spirit, again, I would like to welcome all of you. I'd like to thank my colleague and friend, Karina Karastalina, for her <coughs> Herculean efforts in organizing this conference, and of course, our, our wonderful staff uh, for supporting it. And uh, I'm very, very happy to see so many students in the audience, which is just what Dennis would have wanted to. So thank you very much. Can I ask this cousin to join us? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. I, again, I want to um, echo Kevin and tell that we really want to say thanks for dedicated staff. Uh, what we'll have today, we have the uh, live streaming on Facebook, and you, you can see on the screen there, it's a live uh, streaming on Facebook. It means that, first of all, everyone who will be speaking, asking questions, you should hold microphone. So please do not ask any question until you get hold of this particular device and put it very close to your face. <laughs> Second very important part of it is that we will have to really stuck to our schedule, which you saw, and we will have breaks, 10 minutes break. During this 10 minutes break, we will broadcast our uh, information about SCAR and it will be on this screen, will be timer, if you saw before. So we will start each, each session in the end of timer. So we really will be very, very strict looking at the timing. So I really want to be sure that we know all of this. Um, again, uh, again, welcome. And the first session which we have here, it's session on political conflict and social justice. We will not spend time on introduction because everyone knows everyone. Uh, so let's start, and I'm very pleased to give opportunity for Richard Rubinstein, who also won, one of our founding fathers to, of SCAR, to start the presentation. Thank you, Karina, and thank you for organizing this conference. Uh, this presentation is dedicated to Dennis. Um, you know, Dennis, um, Dennis's magnum opus that really summarized a lot of what he knew about uh, war and peace, which was a lot, was called Capturing the Complexity of Conflict. So I told him I love that title, and uh, he should do a sequel called Reaping the Rewards of Resolution. Uh, we're going to miss Dennis a lot. So let me talk about what is, in, in effect, I try to do this in 12 minutes, um, but I'll not try, I actually do it in 12 minutes. Um, although I'm not uh, describing an article um, 
here I'm describing a book in progress, so I'm going to have to seriously shorten up, shorten up my outline in order to try to hit a few of the high points, or a few of the points I think you'll be most interested in, uh, in this research. Uh, with uh, politics in the United States becoming more volatile and the traditional spectrum, political spectrum widening, new groups in the process of mobilization, uh, political divisions deepening within and between the political parties, the major parties, um, one does tend to think uh, of uh, the last time uh, we had a period of uh, political volatility and change, um, uh, uh, comparable to this, uh, the 1960s and 70s. Um, so the question occurred to me, to what extent is it correct to maintain that, as some people have said, the 60s are in your future? Uh, what are the lessons of the earlier period of political innovation and change, accomplishments and disappointments for a later generation of Americans that, who might, may be entering a period with some similarities to that? We don't know yet. That's partly what the research is about. The research is intended to produce a book for the general public, which methodologically uh, you could call comparative historical analysis. The study combines social theory with personal reflections based on my experience in Chicago during the years 1967 to 74, when everything in the world seemed to be happening in Chicago. Um, and I was um, there, uh, newly arrived with my wife and two young children in flight from law practice. Uh, and I had taken up a job as an associate director of a liberal think tank called the Adlai Stevenson Institute on the University of Chicago campus and found myself in the, in the middle of a political cyclone, uh, which I had not expected, which in many ways, uh, you know, kind of def ended up defining, uh, in, in some respects, who I am, at least as a, th as a, as a, um, a thinker and an activist. Um, I don't have time this morning to describe those activities as much uh, as fun as it would be to do that. And just to put it uh, in a couple of sentences, um, you will recall that before I arrived in Chicago, that is before 1967, uh, there was already a great political upheaval taking place um, in the country. A simultaneous development and escalation of a racial rebellion, um, an anti-war mobilization, and a widespread cultural revolt. Um, and uh, I would detail that a little if I had more time, but I won't, except to remind you um, that um, after Jack Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, the, for the next three years um, involved the simultaneous mobilizations that I just mentioned, in, and involved also violence uh, in the U.S. at a level far exceeding anything we have seen since. Um, just to illustrate that, in 1965, Johnson put half a million troops in Vietnam. The same year, Martin Luther King and the SCLC marched on Selma, Alabama. The Watts ghetto exploded in the first major urban riot. Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. The following year, 1966, there were race riots in 43 cities, including Chicago, Cleveland, Ohio, Atlanta, Georgia, San Francisco. As I was packing for my move to the Midwest, Riots occurred in Newark, Newark, Detroit, and 157 other cities. The Detroit riot produced 43 dead, 1,189 injured, 7,200 arrests, and more than 2,000 buildings burned, destroyed. Um, it's an interesting tendency, isn't it, to kind of forget the extent of the intensity of not just the political conflict, but the violent spillover um, of that conflict, which, all right. 
Um, once in Chicago, uh, if I had time, I would tell you about sort of a political evolution, a, tra a trajectory um, that took me from being a liberal opponent of the war in Indochina to being a radical activist allied with religious pacifists, in particular Dan Berrigan and his group, an active supporter of the Black Liberation Movement, uh, which actually found me my teaching job at Roosevelt University. Uh, and finally, an advocate of socialist revolution associated with Trotskyist organizations, a series of Trotskyist organizations. Um, I also experienced a cultural revolution that was in progress, which I can't and don't want to go into at this point. But I, don't, I mention it because I don't think it's possible to understand the politics of that era or to do an effective comparison of it with this era without talking about the cultural background. Uh, and it, uh, a, a, a movement of rebellion that challenged traditional social norms and institutions across a very wide spectrum. Chicago seemed to be where everything was happening, as I said before. And so I was involved in a series of events, in some cases quite closely involved, beginning with the um, Democratic National Convention riots, which were called later called police riots by an investigating commission, uh, the formation of the Chicago Police Peace Coalition, uh, which I was a chair, uh, the assassination of Black Panther leaders Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, the Weatherman's Days of Rage, mass protests against the Attica prison massacre, the Chicago trial of the eight anti-war leaders stemming from the convention, the trial of Iqbal Ahmad and the Harrisburg Eight for alleged conspiracy to kidnap Henry Kissinger and lots of other fun events on which we spent a lot of uh, painful time. The storytelling strategy in this book is going to be to focus on some specific leaders that I, that I worked with at each stage of the development. And to use that to talk about the importance of organization and leadership in such movements. The importance, I should say, and also the problems uh, associated with leadership. But let me, since I'm going to be running out of time and no time here, uh, let me mention what, some I, what I think some of the preliminary comparative findings are, um, which will be the, um, in, in some ways, the punchline of the book. Um, Socioeconomically, if we look back and then look at the current period, you can see very interesting similarities and differences. Uh, in both eras, one observes a prior period of strong economic growth, rising incomes, and sharpening socioeconomic inequalities. But prior to the 60s, three decades of unprecedented growth had raised expectations across the board and fostered a belief that questions of quantity were being replaced by questions of quality. Um, while current generations, the current generation still live in the shadow of the crash of 2006, 2009, the, and there, so that one senses a greater insecurity, one senses perhaps a greater in, disinclination to take risks, uh, and that is in part because the capitalist economy is more globalized now than it was then, but it's also more volatile. Um, I've already talked about the level of violence in those days being very high compared with the current period, so I won't repeat that. The forms of politics characteristic of the earlier era tended to occupy the gray areas between revolutionary and reform activities with mass demonstrations, nonviolent disobedience, civil disobedience, radical organizing outside the major parties, and marginal violence very much in evidence. A burst of community organization took place in neighborhoods, colleges, and churches, but failed to make much headway in workplaces uh, or in the armed forces. Nationally, these political forces were channeled back into the major political parties in the 1970s, producing the Nixon and Carter regimes. Um, today, one would say that certain forms of politics on the left, that current forms of politics on the left tend to be more conventionally focused on electoral campaigns, although there are signs of break from 
of early signs of a break from conventional electoral politics. This, it seems to me, is linked with the fact that in the earlier period, uh, the uh, politics was strongly influenced by the fact that liberals were in power, and had been for some time, and the advent of uh, a civil rights revolution and an anti-war mobilization, as well as various cultural revolution movements, uh, took place in opposition to those liberal regimes, and in some cases, based on a very deep sense of betrayal by the regimes. Lyndon Johnson was elected president as the peace candidate in 1960, in 1964. Uh, almost immediately thereafter, he got the, got the Tonkin Gulf Resolution passed through Congress and committed the uh, United States to an enormously destructive and disastrous um, war. So the sense of betrayal was very strong. Sociologically speaking, the new political organizations and protest activities were strongly sectoralized with separate identity groups, educated youth, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, women, LGBT groups, and so forth dominant. The class origin of many of the protesters was petty bourgeois, creating a divide between classes that leftist organizers in particular struggled to overcome, uh, mostly without success. In the current period, by contrast, alienated members of the white working class, especially in deindustrialized and rural regions, have been mobilized by the right. Uh, while uh, the left, um, for the most part, uh, wastes its time attacking Donald Trump's personality. Intensified cultural conflicts also characterize both periods, but it seems to me that, um, well, I'm, I bet, I'd better cut this short. We could talk about the similarities and differences between the cultural mm -hmm. movements of cultural revolution in both periods. Just as we could talk, one of my students pointed out when I gave a kind of version of this in a class, um, that the differences between the means of communication have become also crucial. Means of communication in the earlier period were alternative cultural revolution influenced alternative means of revolution, like certain kinds of comic books and, uh, and so on, uh, new magazines, et cetera, mostly print and, and graphic. Uh, nobody had heard of uh, Facebook. And uh, the difference that, make, that that makes to the current period, we still, we're still really not sure what the difference exactly is, what the political implications of, of social media are. But I would conclude this by saying that um, when one looks at the earlier period and the later period, one sees in the earlier period the kind of the combination among rebellious groups, um, which, by the way, were not only youth-based groups. The most anti-war group poll showed in the country was old, was old people, not youth. So it was not limited to youth. But one saw among the uh, oppositional groups in those days a kind of the combination of hope and desperation that seems to be a, a major underpinning for mass movement of mobilization, hope and desperation. You might say that, that those features, hope and desperation, characterize the so-called populist movement of the right um, in, in America today. And if one looks at liberals and leftists and oppositionists to uh, Mr. Trump, one sees plenty of desperation but actually not much hope. If hope means radical hope, if it means a vision of the future, that's both practical and arguably, arguably practical as well as utopian. If it represents the faith that people can make their lives radically better and live a radically better social life, collective life, we're still awaiting the appearance of that vision, a leadership capable of representing it on the part of the anti-Trump forces. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I wonder. Tikhama. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Um, most everyone here, we all know each other. My name is Tahima Lopez Bunyasi. And um, before I get started, I just want to say just a word or two about Dennis Sandoli. Um, I've been here for you know a, a few years here now, and um, the things that 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 come to mind because I'm still grappling with the fact that 
he's, he's not with us in the way that he, he was just last week. Um, that Dennis was always very welcoming to me. Um, and I think he was very welcoming to other people. To, that he would, he would always you know, say hello and he would say my name. Right, he would say my name and, and acknowledge me, and um, very early on, and that that means a lot to somebody who comes on new to a faculty, right? And and it wouldn't matter if it was, you know, we're, we're dragging by the end of the day, and usually the end of the day is actually when we start <laughs> teaching. Sometimes it could be 7 p.m., it could be 10, and, and 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 so when we were passing each other, going from class to class, the fact that he just still had a spirit of of um. Just to be kind meant a lot to me, and it kind of kept me going um, during transitions in the day. And so I just want to say, you know, in, in thinking about him, we can't underestimate the importance of being kind to one another. Um, with that, I'm transitioning to talking about Trump. Um, so uh, my presentation today is called um, "White Privilege Attitudes in the 2016 Election." Oh, that would be helpful. I thought it would be over there. Thanks. Um, I'm using this. Is that correct? Okay. This, um, this presentation is a very short segment of um, a book that I'm writing right now. And the, what, what white racial attitude scholars have done in the, for most of, um, most of the study of white racial attitudes is, is to think about what p white people think about people of color and how they feel about people of color. But seldom are the questions asked, what do white people think about being white? What do white people think about whiteness? And so um, I'm taking this orientation with, with the critical whiteness studies in mind to, um, to, to think about the, that self-reflective attitude and what that might mean for American politics. So uh, what I'm going to be showing today is, is um, some analysis from a survey that I fielded just weeks before the 2016 Iowa caucus, which, as most of you know, is the really the first primary, even though they don't call it a primary, in determining who the uh, presidential nominees for both parties will be. And, and so what I was really excited about was I got to put my own questions on a survey. And, and seldom do you get to be in a position to do that. Um, surveys are very expensive. To field, and so when anytime you want to add innovative questions, something that words something differently, that's actually a very big step, and um, and it's very costly. I was able to do this uh, in a way that was cost effective. I can talk more about that at some other time, but um, so I got to put my own questions on. Let me see. Okay, hoping it's this one. This one? I don't know. Do you know what it is? Uh. Am I pointing in the wrong direction? Forward and back. Paul is always there for me. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> always. Um, okay, so I, I had over um, 900 respondents who self-identified as white in the study. And at the time, there were like a gazillion candidates. Most of them were Republican. And I asked the respondent, who do, who do you like? Who do you like for the election? And this is right, before any vote is cast, Donald Trump is the most popular candidate. He gets 21% of an open field um, at the time support. And I thought, what is going on here? This is, this is, this is interesting, to say the least. Um, he's followed by uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. No one else can touch these candidates at all. The Republicans, I mean, the, there's several of them that are less than 1%, but how could there be more? Because there were like 15 of them at the time. Um, actually, 14% didn't even know who they wanted to support. So the fact that there's 21% going um, for Trump at this time was, was, was pretty interesting, <laughs> pretty intriguing. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm using this support for candidates as my main dependent variable, what I'm trying to um, predict. So this is going to be a numbers presentation, right? Um, and what I did was I, I created a, a dependent variable that, that really measures whether or not you are supporting Trump. Trump against everybody else. Um, when I'm looking at Bernie Sanders, it's Sanders against everybody else. 
Okay. So, okay, am I doing? So, I'm so sorry, Paul. Paul, are you like, is it this one? Right and left. I think I did that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I just have to do it harder. Okay, so the main independent <laughs> variables that I'm looking at here are, are um, these measures of recognizing racial privilege or racial advantage. One question is, uh, is one of comparing the life chances of whites against the life chances of black Americans. Um, another variable is thinking about what does whiteness mean to the respondent? So is being white advantageous? Is it disadvantageous or does it really not matter very much? And then I ask kind of a, I'll admit, kind of a strange question about the worth of whiteness overall. Um, but I, I wanted to see kind of in the calculus of thinking about how does one weigh the importance of something, um, what does this mean to them? Other controls are partisanship, um, the way they reported their political ideology. So I'm a liberal, I'm a, I mean, I'm a conservative. Um, whether or not they opposed the immigration policies that were um, to allow um, unauthorized immigrants into the country to stay. I looked at an employment rate of where the, um, where the respondent lived, because I had zip code data, uh, the change in foreign-born population, um, gender, socioeconomic status, the region of the country, which was um, ma one of the major four regions of the country, and also I wanted to look at their generation. Um, so I broke that down into millennials, uh, Gen X, and baby boomers and silent generation were collapsed together because I think only about six, five or six percent of the, of the uh, sample was, was of silent generation. So I also wanted to ask more contextually, what does, what does white privilege mean to you in a context? Because that's where actually race is made. It's made in, in context. That's how it becomes meaningful. So the question is, who do you think has a better chance of getting a job or a promotion? Whites, blacks, or do they have an equal chance? 50% of white Americans said that there's an equal chance of getting a job or promotion in the United States. Um, just over a third believe that their own racial group is the most advantaged in the, mar um, in the marketplace. And so when I ask the other more personal question, when, um, when trying to get a job, being white has given me an advantage, disadvantage, or not been a factor. Um, the, the percent of, of whites who, who are saying it's an, advan it's an advantageous um, identity, that attenuates greatly um, to just under a quarter of white Americans. 62% are giving the most colorblind answer that's available to them. So what does this mean for support for Trump? White respondents who believe that blacks have a better chance of getting a job um, are pretty much, uh, they will support Trump, um, their likelihood of supporting Trump is around 25% probability compared to every other candidate. Their likelihood to go for him was actually quite strong. Uh, and that's predictable by what they thought about the life chances of white people in the job market. And so, and, and so in comparison, whites who thought that, that their racial group had a better chance, they were less likely to support Donald Trump. Okay. If we look at Sanders, on the other hand, um, his supporters are actually much more racially progressive. So when, um, when white respondents who think that whites have a better chance in the job market are more likely to um, support Sanders in comparison to whites who give a colorblind answer. Um, and so the, there's only statistical significance between those who, who give the white, the white answer and the equal answer. Looking at the more personal level, of, of what advantage means to the respondents. Those who believe that they have been disadvantaged by being white, their likelihood for voting for Trump was a 26% probability. That, that's pretty amazing, um, right? Mm -hmm. So that we're seeing, we're seeing a pattern here of, of disadvantage, of um, relative, and maybe a sense of relative deprivation, right? To put it more into the language of our, of our field. Um, but this is supporting Trump, thanks. <coughs> Finally, I ask, and this is the weird question, right? Are there more advantages to being white or are there more disadvantages to being white? 
the way the f question is framed is that there could actually be both, right? That it's not necessarily an either or, but there could be a more and a less. Um, and I, I asked this question actually um, to, to black respondents as well. And so there was, it was interesting to see what the comparison is. I don't have that for you today, but it was vastly different. <laughs> um, so 57% kind of when push comes to shove and you take out a middle category with an option for a colorblind answer, 57% of whites say that there are more advantages to being white than there are disadvantages. But almost a third did not, um, they said they didn't know. And that's, a, that's actually a huge percentage of don't know. In surveys, you don't get that kind of thing. Um, and so actually I think it's quite meaningful and I, I keep it in the analysis because you can't get rid of that information. Um, so those who, this is just another measure, those who think that there are more disadvantages to being white than there are advantages, those people were also much more likely su to support Trump. Okay. That's, I wanted to keep this short. Um, and I think that there will be plenty to discuss, especially just among the three of us on this panel. Um, and so I'll just um, conclude by saying, you know, the, the, the narrative of relative deprivation resonates strongly in American politics. I think it will continue to. Uh, I think we need to think very critically about, about both race and class um, and how people are thinking about what opportunity is and what, op um, you know, upward mobility is. And um, I think this has a lot to do with our field. So for those of you out there who are thinking about American politics and, and the, the US uh, social, what, what's happening in our society, there's plenty of things to study. So um, I'm here to help you with that. Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for staying exactly in time. All right. Perfect. Uh, OK, thank you. Try to, it's very hard for me to see what is there. We go. Is this in presenter's view, Paul, by, the, by chance? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, this here. Yeah, you can just use the arrows or the. But for seeing, no <coughs> seeing notes. I'll, I'll work without notes. Um, I would like to begin by echoing uh, my colleagues' comments and thinking about. Dennis today, uh, we, our offices are not far from each other and I hear him laughing still, uh, which I often could hear from my office door. Um, and I'm also just struck by a feeling, a feeling of indebtedness to, in, in terms of uh, opening these doors for people from around the world to be able to come together and think about how we create a world that, um, where we don't have to have destructive conflict and violence. So I'll dedicate this presentation to him. Um, I originally, I posted a, what was then a draft of a chapter. Uh, the conference was moved, so uh, that chapter is now out uh, in a book uh, called True Telling from the Margins, which I wrote with Dave Raglan, which is in a book called Systemic Humiliation, edited by Dan Rothbart, who is looking at very intently here from the front, front row. <laughs> um, has, has heard a bit about this before over the last year or so. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about the context of the True Telling pro project and a little bit about how I was involved and, and how um, kind of we, we worked within the larger SCAR community with the idea that in our rich session around the questions and answers that some of the analysis can deepen there rather than uh, me spending the majority of the time uh, just simply in, in framing a couple key points for you. Um, so in, in, in terms of the chapter that I posted when we talk about systemic humiliation, uh, we're really f focusing on uh, the systemic component of it, the literature shows that humiliation often takes place at the intersection of outrage and powerlessness. And so that piece around powerlessness and how um, people can feel a sense of a lack of agency over time is not just a matter of, the, of a production between individuals, but a, a repetition of disadvantage and violence that in this case, when talking about the Truth Telling Project, with a focus on, um, on black people in the United States is repeated uh, and, and, and takes place uh, through the intersections of various uh, institutions. We focused a lot in, in the chapter on the criminal justice system, the criminal injustice system in the United States. Many of you will know the statistics on how um, uh, black people in the United States are disadvantaged by the criminal justice system. We have the lar largest in, uh, incarcerated uh, population in the world, 
Um, black folks are six times more likely to go to prison. Uh, the school to prison pipeline uh, is a metaphor to uh, create language around the fact that many children, especially children of color, those with learning disabilities and those coming from working class backgrounds, are funneled directly from schools into the criminal justice system. We've seen post Columbine a large increase in school resource officers, police in schools, um, and young people going through metal detectors, being searched as they come in um, and out of school, and um, being directly funneled into the criminal justice um, system if they are uh, in a fight or, um, or, or have an infraction of school rules now um, has a direct linkage to, to a larger punitive system. Uh, Bernstein in, in Burning Down the House talks about the message that young kids of color receive in this system, which is that you're worth, any, worth anything to control and incarcerate and little to cultivate. Right, and so this message, I think, is, is part of, um, of how systemic accumulation functions uh, from, a, from a very early age uh, in, in giving um, people a sense that um, their lives don't matter in the United States. Um, the Truth Telling Project grew out of the Ferguson protests. I met one of the founders, Dave Ragland, when I was working with Bernard Lafayette, uh, who I've worked closely with on nonviolence work uh, over the last decade and was assisting him for a series of meetings in, in uh, St. Louis and Ferguson. Uh, local activists, educators, and academics were coming together to see about the possibilities of a truth and reconciliation process in the United States. I think it's really important and, and kind of difficult to, in some ways, paint the picture of what it's like to have a conversation like that that's directly growing out of a protest moment. Because Ferguson was, uh, the kind of repression was very intense. Um, Rich talked about how it was in the 1960s. Uh, while we didn't have the direct deaths of protesters uh, in, the, uh, in the protests, there were obviously the presence of military equipment, the changing of, law, of rules that were then deemed unconstitutional uh, later in terms of you can't stand on the so sidewalk for 20 seconds, young children uh, in protest gas with tear gas, uh, lasers off of guns pointed and tracked on people, the cracking of shields and, and, and body armor with sticks, and uh, most more recently when, uh, when um, uh, police uh, were in engaging in a, in a protest there, uh, and cleared people, they, the police themselves took a protest chant and said, whose streets are streets? To show how deeply the police agencies were drawn into the conflict and see themselves not as a kind of independent organization involved in some level of conflict mediation, but as an actual conflict party whose very identity is at threat. Um, so the Truth Telling Project was really focused on preventing police violence and hearing the stories of people um, uh, uh, and supporting people who had experienced police violence or, and family members who had lost loved ones to police violence. Um, the first uh, weekend was largely focused on bringing people together to discuss what would be possible in terms of a truth telling uh, process in the United States. There were a lot of, number of interesting um, aspects that were discussed. Uh, you know, is, should reconciliation be a focus? Is, true, is a truth-telling process, truth and reconciliation process possible given that we're not in a post-conflict context, that the forms of violence are ongoing? Uh, if testimony, formal testimony is given, in what context should it be given? Who should it be given to? Should this be a state-centered process? Should, it, should we seek to, um, to then leverage those stories for a congressional panel or, or some other form, uh, Imani Scott? Dr. Imani Scott, who write, uh, wrote Crimes Against Humanity in the Land of the Free, was very involved there. And she had put forward some, some ideas about having a, more, uh, a, a, a process that more seek to leverage uh, you know, um, higher level state uh, input and, and sanction. But ultimately, people chose to go with a more grassroots approach um, in trying to create situations in which those who had experienced police violence could be supported in sharing their stories, and then bringing together a range of organizations that were doing work to try to disrupt systemic racism on multiple levels. So um, as the, as the um, sessions grew, uh, there was a variety of kind of pedagogical approaches that were used. Here is Mike Brown's father giving testimony. You can see the, the people in the background there. Um, what was asked for, uh, for those who were testifying, through a series of listening sessions around what they wanted in, in, in listeners uh, was 
to have folks who had experienced um, police violence or had served communities that had experienced police violence at uh, d uh, disproportionate levels, uh, those who had been involved in the protests and those that were generally supportive. Um, so then the testimony becomes sort of a focal point and then what happens afterwards are a series of workshops and activities that explore systemic racism and the cause of causes of police violence. So it, part of the testimony, then those who, um, who are testifying would also be asked what they, why do they think this happened? Why do they think this happened to them, to their family, and why do they think this happens generally? And as you might imagine, there was a range of different answers that, that came up there from the history of racial segregation and colonial, the colonial impact in the United States in dehumanizing people of color through to economic inequality uh, and, the, and the segregation of neighborhoods based on race and class. So a, whole, a whole number of issues were raised. And then people would have the ability to then go and pick and choose workshops that dealt with a variety of systemic issues to explore how people were organizing around it. So the idea was, was kind of twofold. One, that people would have a chance to share their story, that it would be um, shared in a supportive environment, that then there was this kind of analysis component in which they could creatively, through participatory educational processes, engage with models for thinking about how we disrupt systemic racism and really also network with people. Uh, yeah, in terms of, you know, one of the reasons I'm so drawn to um, to protest and antagonistic, antagonistic social action is it creates such a complexity of social interaction. So you have to also remember that we're in Ferguson in St. Louis where every week people are coming from all over the place, right? So Cornel West is coming there and activists from different parts of the country, uh, protesters are Facebooking about how to respond to tear gas with Palestinian protesters who've dealt with the very same tear gas in, in Gaza. And so there's an incredible amount of, of, of social intersection that's taking place. And so the truth telling um, project became a place in which people could sort of deepen those conversations and also do some work around mourning and starting to um, engage with the impacts of this because on the street, many people were still very much on the run. You know, repression was ongoing. You have to remember that the Ferguson protests lasted pr continuously for over a year. Most people don't know that. So we know, for example, the Montgomery bus boycotts lasted over a year. It's touted as one of the longest standing social actions, but, but the Ferguson protesters had continuous action for over a year. Um, uh, and so this provided a very different kind of space, I think, for protesters and activists and advocates to come together. Uh, over time, there was a lot of interest from, from different kinds of players. Um, we had, you know, Desmond Tutu wrote a kind of letter of support uh, over, in the end over, uh, at least in that initial first um, year or two, about 30 or 40 different communities then did truth telling projects in North America themselves. People wanted to engage with the testimony, so we did something called the Night of a Thousand Conversations where we live streamed testimony and people had living room conversations and we created a kind of um, kit around how to discuss systemic racism and how to engage with these discussions. Uh, I worked with Liz London, a master's student at, at SCART, and actually used the Truth Telling Toolkit uh, curriculum that I was um, in the lead with uh, to as a, as a class activity. And so SCAR masters and PhD students, some who are here and smiling uh, as, as I'm mentioning it, uh, put, helped put together the Truth Telling Toolkit, which was just from a practice research intersection point of view really interesting because we interviewed people who were positioned in all different aspects of these processes to kind of, um, after the fact, uh, process chase what had happened, if that makes sense. So we actually mapped the process after the fact in creating the toolkit, a very emergent and participatory process uh, in creating the toolkit. So naturally the toolkit doesn't reflect the full complexity of the process as, as is the na nature of toolkits. Um, so we, we also created this truth telling commons, which I, I just wanted to show here um, a bit. I was gonna originally show some videos. This is not moving. Uh, okay. And no, it's not on here, it's, the, it's a different screen. Um, so I'll just say about the Truth Telling Toolkit, uh, the Truth Telling Commons, that uh, there are a number of the testimonies there. So you, some people you'll know, like Michael Brown's father or Sandra Bland's sisters, but many of the other testimonies. We then kind of coded those testimonies with, um, with themes that were raised when people testified about key issues of systemic or economic um, segregation or oppression. So as you can watch the video and then you can see some base analysis and also click on resources where people are doing analysis of those issues. Uh, 
Um, so, so because we were really, we spent a lot of time thinking about how simply watching testimony or hearing how it impacts someone uh, is not going to necessarily help someone in recognizing how that is not only happening to that individual, but is happening in a systemic context. So we, we try to um, directly build a bridge there. And uh, in closing, which is difficult to do in this case, let me talk about some challenges. Um, there was a concern for power dynamics, the very first truth telling. We got a lot of feedback that it privileged academic and professional voices over local actors. And we kind of worked quite a bit to make more robust processes of feedback with the community. Um, false expectations, like what is the testimony for? This has been a prob problem with TRCs internationally. And so we had to have public um, engagement and ongoing participatory process to talk about how, what could, what would the purpose be of, of testifying and what could we hope for. Some of those answers were about building political power to influence systemic change. Um, uh, others were about reaching people who might not know about the impacts of police violence. There were the risks of re-traumatization and people telling their stories and we did healing rituals, invited people who, who did that kind of work as well as, well as formal counselors. And then I want to re raise a kind of conflict resolution risk when you kind of bring people who are supportive together and close. And this is a, a, a quote here from Fania Davis, that truth telling easily can devolve into retributive constructions of justice, defeating the goal of reconciliation. Geared to looking backwards to focus on blame and punishment, this kind of quote truth tends to leave the broader systems of injustice unchallenged. And I think this is a tension built into trying to create a supportive space in which you can kind of build power to challenge systemic racism, uh, and yet uh, potentially muting critical voices or voices that create complexity and therefore uh, creating a kind of echo chamber in which uh, you actually uh, weaken your ability to uh, impact systemic change. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, what, what is great about our school is that we really work together with our wonderful colleagues. What is good about oh, yes? What is good about our school that we really work together with our wonderful PhD students. So in each session we will have PhD students as a discussant. So they have ten minutes to give us together comments. Good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity and the privilege of listening to the professors speak on this wonderful morning again. Feeling uh, Professor Dennis Sandoli's absence uh, with us, but also seeing many of his gifts reflected in what the panel is presenting. Dr. Dennis Sandoli had immense knowledge and immense experience, which is also equally represented here, and also one of his passions for mixed methodology, um, which also is highlighted of creative, strong, and effective analysis that is present here by the panel and by the other faculty members. So I think that we are representing Dennis's gifts to, um, to the school very well this morning. So thank you very much, Professor Corostolino. Um, I wanted to sort of give a very brief overview. Um, as much of this panel has been structured, we first had uh, Professor Rubenstein, who gave us the historical, and then we had Professor Lopez Bignasi, who gave us sort of the political level and then at the grassroots level of what's going on. And I thought that this panel was extremely well uh, put together to provide those particular analysis uh, and approaches. What has been interesting about each one of their presentations has been the subtext of and what they've emphasized are pieces of what it is to be human and what it is to be part of a person and what's driving conflicts. So Professor Rich Rubenstein was speaking about fears and hopes and um, the struggle with um, desperation and how we are engaging in sort of spaces of cultural contestation versus economic contestation, engaging in um, how do we understand stability and order versus chaos and trying to find spaces for chaos to be able to be present in that space when it's not working for ourselves. Uh, Professor Tayman Lopez highlighted and continued this theme looking at what happens sort of at the identity level that has impacts on the national level. And again, talking about self-image. What, 
who are we talking about identity and how is that identity being represented at the particular national level and having be able to access the national level to be visibly um, present in terms of oneself within the state and society. And then again with Professor uh, Romano, at the local level, how do we engage in identity groups? And what was interesting about each one of them was also talking about voice. Not just emotions, not just the fears, but how do we engage in voice? How do we capture voice as a force, for the, as a driver of political conflict, but also as what each group is defining as social justice? So not only is it voice, but it is also being heard and seeking ways and methodologies to find being heard and being recognized, culminating in being what I see, and thanks to a comment by Professor Romano, basically becoming embodied. How do we, as citizens of this United States, become embodied as part of the state, as part of our groups, as part of our communities? And what does this embodiment mean in terms of being able to be, to be able to fr be free to act, to be, and to be coming in those acts as well? So I just wanted to ask um, some questions also for discussion about what is the power then of this being and being present in terms of identity, in terms of history and drawing upon those histories. And how is it this need to be and to have one's being embodied within the state and within one's communities engaged um, at the conflict resolution level? How can we see that this can be pushed forward? So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Um, I would want to say that the last paper kind of summarizes the, the three sets of uh, papers in, in the sense that it um, raises the questions of whose narrative is key to a form of resolution. Um, is it the victim or the perpetrator of violence? The situation described in the situations described in the text, in the papers, um, kind of anal analyzes um, some form of intractable conflict. And the truth-telling project highlights this in, in, in greater details. I want to say that the, the truth-telling project kind of um, highlights a shift from the usual truth and reconciliation commissions that evolve in post-conflict uh, post -conflict spaces and argues on the systemic nature of the oppression against black people in the US. It reiterates the narratives of persistent existential threats and cultural and symbolic assaults that intersect the ways that overwhelm and generate feelings of powerlessness in the black community. TTP, the truth, uh, truth Telling Project, also raises a question of whose narrative, again, like I, like I said, is valid when we want to, we want to you know, stay on the, on the path of resolution. The experience of humiliation involves a loss of feelings of power and, and agency. Uh, and apart from Lidna et al. that the paper cites, Jeremy, Jijens and Scott Etran, 2008, also make that assertion in the study of Palestinians, which is about the fact that while, he, you know, while the experience of humiliation does not seem to contribute to political violence, it does seem to suppress support for conflict resolution. To drive on the point, the argument on power dynamics, the argument on power dynamics, the seminal work of Michel Alexander, the new Jim Crow, as the paper quotes, is made to highlight the many instances that blacks have, have been stripped of their power. Um, the paper points to the fact that approaches like stop and frisk demonstrate ineffective and damaging practices towards youths of color. And Didier Fassin also emphasized this power asymmetry in, in his humanitarian reason text. 
one would wonder that in 2004, St. Louis earned the third most dangerous city in America. And the question is, what informs this information? Is it a kind of propaganda, or uh, does it not just kill the judgments of law enforcement officers to make them commit these kinds of systemic um, suppression or oppression of, of the black community. Basically, I want to state that the discourse of intractable conflict doesn't really come out strong in the papers, but it's, it, it's, it's latent. And the reason why I said that is because if TTP is a grassroots response to systemic humiliation and the rash of police killings of black people in the US, that response is truly a social psychological infrastructure that validates the systemic black oppression as a form of intractable conflict. That's my little contribution. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, to have it more interactive within this time, let's take maybe two free questions and then we'll give opportunity for panel to respond for uh, discussions and questions. Do we have questions? Comments, questions? Uh, okay, I will let you think and let's give opportunity for our uh, discussant quickly respond for comments and then we'll open the floor. Yeah. Going down the line. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about Molly's question about, about being in conflict resolution. Um, I think as it pertains to the work I presented today, what, what most comes to mind is um, the, the portion of, of the population that I call renegades or racial renegades. Um, these are white Americans who are thinking critically about what it means to be white and are naming their privilege and that in doing so, they're also more likely to support policies that undermine their privilege, and this is radical. Um, some, I, I guess, would call it, uh, in a way, a kind of a class suicide, which I know sounds like a very violent type of uh, act, but, but it's, it's undermining of an identity. And, um, and so when it comes to what it means to be, um, the, the, the question that I'm orienting my, my book around is um, in, in thinking about uh, white uh, racial dominance as a, really as an agreement, the way that it's theorizes in, in social contract language is that um, uh, these renegades are, are looking for a better offer. Hmm. And so um, I think that that's my response to at least the, the thought of, of, of what it could mean to resolve conflict, is, is to think about what one's um, own, ide own identity is bringing to that conflict and then how one can, can be really subversive and undermine it and create something new in the process. Uh, I, I'm thinking a lot about, from the comments about Tehama's uh, presentation, uh, and I'm glad that you just said this, this idea of racial renegades. Uh, and we spent a lot of time thinking, uh, we were quite nervous about putting the testimony online and just having it w where anybody could engage with it and potentially even attack people or use it for negative purposes. And, um, so, but on the other hand, it was clear that for numerous people testifying, uh, Michael Brown Sr. included, uh, and others that they wanted to reach people who might not be impacted directly by police violence. Living room conversations grew from that. So Tehama's work you know, zones in on how when people feel disadvantaged, when white people feel disadvantaged, they're more likely to, uh, to engage with rhetorics that, that further position them as adversarial to other groups, I think. This is my analysis of it, at least. Um, and so what, some of the typical ways that we engage with that is around these kind of constructions of like racial, of um, a white fragility and white privilege. But that doesn't seem like it's gonna engage so well necessarily with that perception of the world. And so I think racial renegade is really interesting um, in terms of uh, thinking about uh, for people who, who, white people who think they're disadvantaged, how do they contextualize that experience in ways that create pathways for solidarity? 
Uh, and that creating that pathways for solidarity is, is really, I think, <laughs> interesting. And from the truth telling um, lens where we see um, you know, racism as systemic, then there's all kinds of ways in which uh, people are impacted because of that systemic context. In other words, white people are impacted too. And if they're impacted economically, then they, one of the ways that they're, they may be, that white and, and black folks might be uh, in some ways uh, more susceptible to class disadvantage is in the perception of themselves, is in the erasure of their class similarities through this kind of racial separation, which is very much baked into the American project from the very beginning. So, um, so racial renegades. You know, because there's a certain kind of activeness, and so it's, it's a kind of, it's a racial renegade. And then class suicide got me thinking, because yes, class suicide, and then on the flip side, maybe the only way out. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, you know, kind of thinking about the flies in the jar kind of metaphor there. It, it may be, su is it suicide or is it, uh, is it a way to fly away from the light? Uh, Karl Marx is 200 years old this month. Um, <laughs> He had something to say and about this. Uh, <laughs> and I, I mention that because uh, not only because it makes me want to sing happy birthday to you but <laughs> but but because um, the the uh, elephant in the room is the relationship of class to identity uh, a subject which I I, I, I I was implying in my remarks uh, was not adequately dealt with in the 60s and 70s and it's still not adequately dealt with. Um, the, what Tahema says and what Arthur says are really important, be, the, be important, some important beginnings of an attempt to reconceptualize, I think, the relationship between class, race, and other forms of identity. But when Tahema mentioned the relative deprivation, it made me think, yes, it's absolutely right. There's a strong resonance of relative deprivation theory with what goes on in America anyway. Um, but in the instant case, um, since, um, uh, since the liberal uh, establishment has come to embrace uh, a form of identity, one form at least, of identity politics, I think if Gerb were around, he would probably say that the kind of relative deprivation that a lot of people are feeling, at least on the left, is decremental. That is to say, they're worried about losing the gains that were made in the, in, in the period beginning in the 60s. And the problem with decremental deprivation, as Gerb points out, uh, is that it tends to produce conservative po political resolve. It, you're trying to preserve what's being lost what you fear may be lost. So you're not in that state of mind that I characterized before as radical hope. You're not imagining a new way of organizing our social life uh, that in, in which class interests and, uh, and uh, identity interests uh, are satisfied by a systemic change, by a systemic transformation. We don't, part of the problem is I think that it's very important, especially for people in, like us, I mean, for people in universities, people being paid to think, is to think through the class issue. Num a number of us here, I think, are, are, have begun doing that. I know Solon has begun doing it. Several, I know Dana and others have. Um, but it's hard to do because we're, talking, we're not talking about factory workers anymore. Trump may want to talk about factory workers, but that's not, you know, the world is not going to be, continue to produce factory workers, at least in the advanced capitalist states, in the same way that it did. So if we reconceptualize class and then try to relate this to ethnicity, race and ethnicity, how do we do it? That would be, uh, that would, could constitute an agenda for an institution like this for the next few years. Wonderful, thank you. We can have one or two questions. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, exciting uh, panel. I had a question for Tehama, um, Romano, and Rich. How does your positionality uh, as a researcher, your identity, however you choose to identify, how does that intersect 
with the research you do on race? Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, my question goes to Romano, and my my question is: in one of the uh, cardinal um, uh, strength of truth and concentration uh, uh, panel or program in South Africa was the willingness of the whites to acknowledge that indeed they had offended the blacks for time. I wonder if in your research, like Tehima said, um, some whites were not willing to acknowledge that in fact they were um, privileged by the society. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, especially in my class, I came across people who blatantly deny that indeed there is this privilege. And my question is, in doing this research, how would or how, how do you think that this denial among the whites about the privilege they enjoy over the color people in America and the way the society is structured, how do you think this their denial would affect truth telling in future and eventual reconciliation mm. in the system? Mm. Thank you. Um, if I can speak to, um, to Daniel's question first, I, it's a great question, and um, I think it's a question that anybody who's doing uh, their scholarship should ask themselves. Um, as far as um, my work, so, so I am biracial, and uh, my mother's side of the family is mainly from England, my father's side is mainly from Mexico. I'm, as you can see, a light-skinned person, and um, I in, in my adulthood, I feel like I am actually lighter than I looked when I was a child. I feel like my phenotype, my presentation looks different than I did actually when I was younger. And, um, and so that has actually affected the way I think about my identity to a, to a certain degree. Um, in studying whiteness and in studying privilege, um, I, I have I both I have a very intimate relationship to that racially, and I also um, some people talk about you know a biracial identity as being one that is you know one can kind of step back and look at certain things in a different way. Um, I, I I also feel like there's a distance because my um, even my light skin and, and racial privilege that um, because of my, my the way I, I am approximate to to whiteness is um, is very clearly uh, uh, tenuous. It can be. Um, I, don't, I don't draw from white privilege at every moment, but I often do, right? People ascribe a white racial identity to me, and so, um, so I, I do understand, um, and especially given the, the people who I've lived my life with, right, my, my white family, I, I do understand that it's very easy to not think about race when you have the normative identity that's racial. At the same time, um, I have never, identified myself as white. I have never thought of myself in that way. And so um, sort of kind of my, my racial identity was always contested, like always contested. And, um, and so I appreciate when whites are able to go there. And, and sometimes um, I'm actually starting my book, I think what I'm going to do with the intro is with a story that I heard about um, an activist who said, I put a post-it note on my dashboard that says, remember that you are white today. And I thought, wow, what a, what a very small gesture, but actually what a, like, a very in, a possibly ingraining gesture to, to prompt oneself to think. Um, and so um, I, I've gone through a lot of interesting uh, growing pains in regards with, with people who I love very much as I've done this, this research. Um, because it's very, it is personal to me. At the same time, um, you know, I'm able to, to give my 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 critical and I, I, some. I don't know if we're going to say it's objective. We can all argue about how objective our work is, um, but um, but I think that I have when I'm doing ethnographic work, I need to take into account the very complex ways that people may read me. Especially, I introduce myself. My name is Tehema Lopez Bunyasi. 
None of that reads as white. On paper, when you hear it, none of it. Um, and then they see me, and then it's like, hmm. Like, you know, I think, I think some of the people who I've interviewed have thought, you relate to me, right? And they'll open up on, in a way that is, um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad, you know, you need to have um, confidence, right, when you're talking to somebody. And, and as a researcher, you need to be able to extend that, um, that, that, that their words are trusted with you. And, um, but, but I, I, do think, I do think people open up to me, and particularly because I look to them white. That's how they see me. Uh, particularly white people think I am white. Do you want to take it and then I'll go less? No, no. You want me? Okay. Um, I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, so I think a couple different things come to mind. Um, so I try to ground my work in deep relationship building um, across lines of difference. As a scholar, that means um, that I sometimes am working in a place for years before I um, start to take any kind of collaborative efforts. Um, and I try to do work that I'm getting feedback from the community that it's useful. So taking seriously questions and concerns that people have um, about the work they're trying to do and trying to um, support that. Uh, I'm a white guy, uh, uh, brown skinned, tan skinned white guy who sometimes is racially ambiguous but is really protected by whiteness. Um, have not experienced systemically being like police violence and kind of constant surveillance and um, and so that really influences my my experience and um, and so that's a big part of why that ref ongoing reflective process and deep relationship building is important. I want to emphasize that just because I don't think we will have even though you might have relationships, you might not have the kinds of real relationships where people can check. Um, and are willing to check your blind spots um, uh, in the process. So I, I often co-write in addition to trying to do this relationship building um, on the ground. Um, I, my background is in part uh, that I grew up in a, in a, in a rural white community uh, and uh, grew up around a lot of racism, uh, both inside my family sometimes, but especially in the wider community. I went to high school in a city that was predominantly black and it was in a completely white high school, 98% white. Um, and so, and this was at the time of the Rodney King beatings and there were, um, there was riots in the city. And so m the, my kind of deracialized or post-racial world kind of popped right when I was in high school. So, um, and, and I engaged, it would, had engaged with those issues in some ways early. Um, so that feels kind of insufficient. I, I really wish that we could talk for an hour about this, or you know. Um, but those are some of, some of the kind of uh, key components of it: is having uh, doing relationship building, having critical, reflective relationships with people, trying to do co-writing work, trying to take seriously the work that people are doing in ways that there's feedback that that is useful to people in the actual project. So I'm rarely doing research in a way in which I'm not project-based with people where we're doing something together. Um, so the, and the research kind of grows from that um, from that work. Okay. Um, well, I'm doing doing um, uh, this comparative historical work, and and uh, you know, by the way, I've been making this pitch for some time. I'm going to make it more more intensely uh, in the future. That comparative history is a, I think, one of the disciplines that ought to be important to our field ought to be more important than it is to our fields. Actually, what we do a lot, but we don't call it by name and study it as a, as a legitimate method, because history is so soft, you know. Um, well, at any rate, doing this um, uh, work on the uh, 60s and 70s um, put me in mind that um, when I talk about it, although I'm, I was a little bit old for the youth revolution, um, um, I was in many ways a, a typical new left, a typical person prepared to be a new leftist. That is to say, from a liberal family, an upwardly mobile uh, liberal family, uh, from uh, a, a, mi a minority group, although one that had done fairly well in America, the Jews. Um, 
with a kind of, um, taught a kind of high expectations, socially speaking, but also um, politically speaking, taught a kind of idealism, if you like, which put me in a perfect position to call my parents sellouts for not seeing the, the, what the next step in our social evolution should be. Um, so, uh, so it's fun to think about that and then to reflect about objectivity. Um, if, if, as I said before, I think we were, we're sort of in an intellectual, we have a, a, a form of intellectual crisis and in the difficulty of conceptualizing class and its relationship to other political factors, uh, I think maybe even and a worse intellectual crisis, maybe a more immediate even intellectual crisis, has to do with the whole question of objectivity, subjectivity, the question of truth. Um, I mean, in my career, I was taught lots of different kinds of truth. I was taught uh, the lawyer's truth. Uh, I was taught the businessman's truth, the ad man's truth, the negotiator's truth. Um, where's objectivity in any, in any of that? And when we talk about objectivity, what the hell are we talking about? Um, when I say that, I'm, I'm realizing at the same time that to be nihilist about it, uh, that is to say Trumpian, uh, also, is, is no solution. It puts you in the it, it, it puts you in the in the swamp. Um, so, I'm looking to Dan Rothbard and other philosophers to 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 gr to grapple with this, as a few philosophers are are starting to do, and to help us define what it means to be reasonably objective. In the uh, in this this allegedly post-truth era, um, it's it's a subject c closely related to the issue of neutrality and conflict resolution, don't you think? Um, because the idea that one should be impartial, as between parties, makes perfectly good sense, uh, except you know no one is really. Um, maybe you can be impartial between parties, but like Jim Lowey used to say, you can't be impartial regarding the process. And other people would say, you can't be impartial regarding your vision of the social, of, of the good society. Mm -hmm. right? We all have a vision of the good society that influences how we feel about conflict and the parties to conflict, and it makes no sense to me to say that we don't or to say that we should somehow neuter ourselves, not just neutralize, but neuter uh, ourselves in order to pretend to assert to some kind of above the fray objectivity. Um, right? uh, okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting started. I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry, I, I would love to hear, but I, I, I'm the one who is responsible for time today. Uh, I just, one thing before we finish, because we all deeply, deeply missing Dennis, and uh, I, I don't want to be emotional, we really missing him so much. And because this is conference celebration of our achievements, Kevin, maybe we should have this annual Dennis Sunderly conference on SCAR achievements. I don't know if there is an opportunity to name a conference, but we can, right? We can establish our own practices. So let's call it the Nisandali Conference of SCAR Achievements. <laughs>